Times are changing at UC Berkeley. The unprecedented $110 million Hewlett Challenge gift, the launch of the Energy Biosciences Institute, and new proposals to increase financial aid for students. Just a few of the developments that will define the university's mission and identity for years into the future. Coming up on this special edition of Bear in Mind, UC Berkeley Chancellor Robert Bergino joins Dan Mogoloff from the Office of Public Affairs for a wide-ranging discussion of the major plans and priorities that are shaping the Cal campus. Chancellor Bergino, thanks for joining us and thanks for helping us turn the tables. Usually in Bear in Mind, you're the one who asks the questions and today we're going to put you in the hot seat. I want to talk a little bit about initiatives, developments on campus, and a look to the year ahead. Glad to be here, Dan. It's Great. always fun to uh, do these interviews with you. On September 10th, you announced the largest gift in the university's history, a $110 million grant, challenge grant from the Hewlett Foundation. Talk to us a little bit about exactly what it entails, what you think the outcomes will be, and why it's important. Uh, needless to say, we were all extraordinarily pleased when the Hewlett Foundation informed us that they were going to give us this grant. Uh, the, it's actually $113 million altogether, uh, $110 million of which will be used as a challenge grant to create 100 chairs and $3 million to improve our investment strategy to ensure that the $110 million plus the match of $110 million, making a total of $220 million, will be well invested. The $110 million uh, will end up leading to the creation of uh, 80 chairs funded at the $2 million level, which will be broadly distributed across the entire university and another 20 chairs funded at the $3 million level, which will be used uh, for various interdisciplinary kinds of programs, whether it's the Berkeley Diversity Research Initiative or Energy Research or Computational Biology or what have you. So for people who aren't familiar with what exactly it means to fund a chair, is that money then that goes to uh, faculty compensation? What, what happens with that money? What does that mean to fund a chair? So an important part of this is we've actually changed the model for how chairs uh, are handled here at Berkeley. So in the past, funding for chairs was typically uh, rather more modest, the endowment was less, and the entire income from the chair went to the chair holder to help support that person's scholarly research. What we realized in our discussions with the Hewlett Foundation is that we needed a new model in which, of course, the chair income would support the scholarship of the chair holder, but would also contribute to the commons, that is to say, would would help uh, underpin the financial um, health of the university. So in this case, the first $25,000 of the income will go as a scholarly allowance to the chairholder. The next $25,000 will go to support a graduate fellowship. And the remaining, which may be 50,000, maybe more depending on the chair, uh, will be used for faculty salary support over and above the state funding. So take us behind the scenes. How does it work? Does the foundation come to you? Do you go to the foundation? And what do you say? What's the case that you make? How does, how does yeah. that work for a grant that size? So this turned out to be really an uplifting experience, I must say. Uh, from the day I arrived here uh, as chancellor, it was clear that we face a really significant challenge at Berkeley and indeed at all public universities because of the incredible success that the elite private universities have had uh, in, raising in raising an endowment. So uh, in conversation with various people, including one of the persons I knew on the Hewlett board, uh, I learned that they, might, they were concerned about this issue for public universities and might be open to an approach. So I basically went, first talked to Paul Brest and a few of the people working there uh, about my concern about the health of public education at the university level in the United States and how I thought the Hewlett Foundation might help. And to both my surprise and joy, uh, Paul Brest and Susan Bell actually followed up this meeting by coming up to Berkeley, uh, discussing it further and saying, indeed, they thought the Hewlett Foundation would be interested in helping us. What's the recognition? What's the special case? I mean, what concerns you about public education in the United States? I mean, why does it matter and why did it matter to the Hewlett Board to try to preserve and protect it? When you come to California, and coming here to Berkeley, uh, where we have, it's not that we've suffered from lack of state support, actually the state funding has gone up at the rate of the CPI, but the marketplace for universities has become incredibly more complicated, in part because of the admirable and incredible success 
and the elite private universities in raising really quite significant funds. And so although the state has funded us, I think, at a level they would view as generous, it no longer provides the resources that we need to attract and retain the very best faculty here at Berkeley, or at least will need in the future. And so faculty are willing to make sacrifices and to take lower salaries to be at a great public university. But there's a tipping point. And in our view, we were rapidly approaching that tipping point. What is it that you see is so vital to preserve about a public university? I mean, what was the heart of the right. case there? Right. So there's not a single sentence answer to that question. But uh, Berkeley distinguishes itself in many different ways. The statistic I like to quote all of the time uh, is that if you look at the economic cross-section of our undergraduate students, then more than a third of our undergraduate students receive federal Pell Grants, which means that their family income is under uh, about $40,000 a year. It turns out that at Berkeley, we have more Pell Grant recipients than all of the Ivy League universities put together. And to me, this is a really dramatic illustration. We represent the conduit into mainstream society of extraordinarily talented people from very modest backgrounds who could never imagine going to a Harvard or a Yale or a Princeton. And so it's our obligation as a public university to guarantee that every single qualified person in California, independent of their financial means, can get the same kind of education here at Berkeley that they would get if they went to Harvard or to Yale or to Princeton. Of course, there's more than that. We also have an ethos here at Berkeley of a real commitment to public service. So after the students come here, then we also educate them in how to give back to society. And also much of our research is publicly oriented. For example, the major thrust we have now on uh, global climate change and energy conservation is ultimately public service research. It's using our best talents to solve one of the most important problems facing all of society. So you've sort of delineated some characteristics that define this institution, that differentiate this institution. But you also mentioned the fact that not all, fa that not all faculty here, really it's just a matter of money for them. That one of the, some of the reasons that they stay here at Berkeley go beyond the financial. Can you back that up? Do you have any anecdotes? Do you have any data that, that suggests that might be the case, that there's something special that holds faculty here on yeah. this campus? I happen to have... Uh, uh, a very dramatic example of this uh, happened very recently where several of our uh, outstanding mid-career faculty were being recruited by an East Coast University. Uh, each one was offered an academic year salary of about $100,000 a year more, and they were offered discretionary funds, each one separately at the level of $4 million each. This is astounding since we have set aside altogether $15 million a year for are fit 1,500 faculty. So I met with two of these. They came into my office, sat down, we exchanged pleasantries, and then I said, sort of, what's the issue? Then immediately, one of them launched into a speech about the poor state of the undergraduate laboratories he was teaching in. He didn't want to talk about his salary, right? He didn't want to talk about, about his discretionary resources. He wanted to talk about our teaching facilities. Now, as soon as he did that, I said to myself, I'm going to do whatever I can to keep this person at Berkeley. And that differentiates, I think, in many ways, our faculty from those at other institutions. Uh, of course, ultimately, his salary mattered, but or their salaries mattered, but you know, we came to a reasonable compromise there. And their own laboratories mattered in the sports of their graduate students, but they sufficiently enjoy being at Berkeley. They sufficiently like the kind of students that we have here that we just had to come as close as we could to providing them the kind of environment that they felt that they could be happy in and that they could teach in the way they want to be able to teach. Wow. Um, the Hewlett Grant's a challenge grant. It's a $110 million challenge grant, which if I do my math correctly, means that it could yield as much as $220 million. Do you see that as a vote of confidence in the alumni community and the community of donors who supports this institution? Or do you think it's really a challenge to meet that goal? I'm, of course, hoping that it won't be a challenge. But one of the important features of this grant is that these chairs are being broadly distributed. Mm. 
And so this is going to provide a motivation to every single department to begin participating in helping in part to underwrite their own financial stability. So this will not just be a central administration responsibility, this will be a community responsibility. So I think that this grant is going to fulfill many purposes and of course the Hewlett people understood this as well. Uh, so I'm quite confident that we will raise the money. Uh, I've, I've now had a number of conversations where people randomly and said that, who have heard about this in advance said to me, this is just great and I was thinking of doing X, but now I'm going to come up with the matching funds and create a chair. Understood. Um, when you say distributed broadly, every department, every college, every school? Every college, uh, proportionately. So for example, 17% of the faculty here at Berkeley are in arts and humanities, and so 17% of the chairs will be in arts and humanities. Now, of course, if it turned out ultimately that some faculty failed to raise the matching money, that at a certain stage, we would then have to open those chairs up to other possibilities. But I'm hopeful that each of the colleges and schools will be successful. Is one of the reasons the arts and humanities component is important to you because those are disciplines that tend to be left on the side in terms of some of the partnerships we're forming here on the campus with government, with the private sector, and that don't necess necessarily share in the benefits of those sorts of research endeavors that have become common on campuses across the country? That's one reason, but I would say, you know, arts and humanities and social sciences together are at the core of the university. And we must have great arts and humanities and we must have great uh, uh, great social sciences, otherwise we're a technical institute. And I used to work at a technical institute, I like being at a real university. <laughs> Pardon me, I take that back about MIT, it was a great place, but, but you know, much of the appeal of, of, of Berkeley is our combination of breadth and depth. I mean, you can have any question about anything, uh, except perhaps, you know, if your dog's ill, then you have to go to Davis, but, but to the veterinary school. But otherwise, we have people who are world's experts in every single subject, and, and that creates a culture which I think is a very appealing aspect of Berkeley. So I wanted to make sure that every single faculty member would have the opportunity of participating in this, and that we would be supporting the entire university, not just part of it. Now, uh, we were just speaking about research partnerships, which brings up the subject of the Energy Biosciences Institute, and that's the proposed institute that's being funded by the $500 million grant from BP. Um, we're now in September, and the expectations had been the contract would be signed by July. What's the delay? Is there some cause for concern here? Uh, no. Uh, not surprising, this is history setting, and given all of the public attention to this, and also because of our own values and standards, we wanted to make sure that all four participants are happy with the agreement that we end up with. And so we're just carefully working through all of the details of the contract and, and dotting I's and crossing T's. And I think that in the end, the program will be much the better for it because we've got, tried to think of every kind of possibility. Of course, it'll turn out there's some strange thing that we will never have thought of, but, but I think everyone has entered this with such positive feelings and wanting to make it work, so I'm confident we'll end up with, uh, with an agreement that 98% of our faculty will be very happy with. Now, um, as I'm sure you remember, some of the critics of the, uh, of the BP partnership of the Energy Biosciences Institute were afraid that the university was going to simply roll over and sell out and not protect its values and its principles. But you seem to be suggesting that part of what's happening in terms of the negotiations around the contract is all the institutions are really kind of standing up for what's important to them? Absolutely. You know, and I, Steve Chu and I, of course, have talked. I've been on the phone uh, interacting with Richard Herman, the uh, ch ch chancellor of the University of Illinois. I've also, you know, interacted with Steve Coonan, the vice president for research at BP. So we've all been actively involved. But let, let me come back to this. Uh, public service because in much of this discussion several things got lost. One is, as a public institution, it's our obligation to address the deleterious effects of global climate change and the economic effects of, of uh, not being energy uh, self-sufficient. And it's our view that in order to fulfill our public mission to do this effectively, 
you know, we can't just do ivory tower research. It's actually a critical component of this field that you couple to a large energy company. And so, whereas because of the coupling to a large energy company, some people try to misrepresent that as selling out. Actually, it's the exact opposite. It's in guaranteeing that we will fulfill our public mission. Well, in a recent article in California Magazine, uh, Chris Somerville, who's the expected executive director of the Energy Biosciences Institute, actually said that he thought the university would wind up having a greater influence on BP than vice versa. Do you agree with that? Yes. Be because in the end, uh, this research is going to be dominated by the university participants. I mean, at the time we signed the contract, or not signed the contract, signed the initial agreement, BP, I believe, employed four biologists. <laughs> and, and between, you know, I, I don't know how many hundreds there are between Illinois, ourselves, and the lab. I mean, we play a dominant role in this. Uh, and, and I think that it's, and we were going to pursue this line of research anyway. And BP came along after we had worked out our own strategy or how we wanted to pursue it, certainly between the laboratory and, and the university. And so I think that, that, therefore, in the end, we will play the dominant role. But BP will provide incredible, incredibly valuable guidance to help us you know, decide when we have to go one way or another which way is actually going to be successful and have the impact on the climate that we hope it will. I don't want to dwell too much in the past, but looking back last year, the debate was quite passionate about the EBI. Do you see that debate as being important and influential anyway, or was it just sort of a, a speed bump on the, on the road to a completed contract? You know, it wouldn't have been Berkeley if there wasn't such a debate, right? I mean, this is part of what I love about Berkeley, actually. And in the end, it played a very useful role because it ended up leading the faculty to vote formally that no one group of faculty could prevent another group of faculty from doing the research because the first group objected to the source of the funding. And this really sets a very important precedent and defines academic freedom very precisely. Now, one of the other parts of the process that I don't think a lot of people are aware of was the inclusion of faculty representatives and, and student representatives in a consultative role during the contract negotiations. What's your view? Have they, have they had good, substantial input? Have they affected the way things have unfolded? My understanding is that the faculty have been outstanding, and actually that, that, and I've gotten a few emails directly from the faculty just, you know, raising issues that I ought to know about. And so, as far as I know, it's only been positive. Uh, there also have been consultations with the graduate students. They have not been as formally involved. Mm -hmm. but that's, I've also met with the graduate student leadership, and that's also been quite positive. Uh, but, you know, uh, we were consulting with the faculty in the Academic Senate from the very beginning of this process. And so, having the faculty involved in the actual negotiations is not new. And it didn't escape a lot of people's attention that BP chose to partner with three other public institutions. And I'm wondering if you see this sort of research in some way connected to the essence of what this institution, Berkeley, is all about. You're absolutely correct that we have a commitment to working on problems which are important for society, which have huge implications for society. You know, when people talk about global climate change, uh, and the crisis that we're facing. They talk about how the energy companies may make huge amounts of money uh, out of this. They forget about the fact that the people who will suffer the most overwhelmingly are the poor. There are billions of people who, in this world who live on less than 50 cents a day, and that 50 cents will disappear if the temperature goes up by 10 degrees. And so this is a commitment to solve a problem which ultimately will alleviate global poverty amazingly. And there is a direct connection between them. Um, you know, you mentioned sort of complex societal problems and a role a public university plays. And I'm going to try to connect to segue to a rather important appointment you made, and that's the new Vice Chancellor of Equity and Inclusion. Um, tell me a little bit about the man you've selected to fill that role and what your hopes and expectations are. So I couldn't be more pleased that Gabor Basri, Professor Gabor Basri, has agreed to take on uh, this responsibility. We had a national search. Uh, we got to talk to outstanding people from uh, around the country, from Texas, from Massachusetts, from Minnesota, from Washington, uh, uh, et cetera. And so we heard uh, some really interesting 
uh, viewpoints on these challenges of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we got to see a number of outstanding people as well. Uh, in the end, uh, the committee decided that uh, our own Gabor Basri, who was uh, an outstanding astrophysicist, uh, interim head of the Department of Astronomy, but also with a long proven track record of work in the area of equity and inclusion, and who was passionate about uh, leading Berkeley in this area, that he was the best candidate. And, you know, he's the kind of person I love to negotiate with, which is that, you know, I offered, asked him if he was willing to take it on, and he said yes instantly. He didn't say, I'll take it on if you increase my salary by $75,000 and you do this and you do this and you do this and you do this, right? This is uh, the kind of faculty member I was talking about before where their first commitment is to Berkeley as a, as a public institution and only secondarily do they think about themselves. Let me play devil's advocate for a second. There's been a lot of criticism um, about the creation of this position. There are those who have claimed it's window dressing, it's lip service, it's about being politically correct. What's your response to that? Where does, where does this come from? Why put this at the top of your priority list? Uh, if it uh, was just being politically correct, it wouldn't have attracted the amount of attention that it has, much of it negative. So, so the easy thing to do would have been to do what every other university has done, which is to create an, you know, someone down in the bowels of the university responsible for equity and inclusion. From my point of view, it was critical to have an appointment at the vice chancellor level because the vice chancellors collectively discuss every single decision that affects the university, whether it's building a new building or uh, creating a new scholarship program or creating new kinds of courses or how we assign faculty positions or what have you. Uh, and so I felt that we would not make the kind of progress we needed to make if equity inclusion were, we're not at the table for every single decision. And so we needed to create the position at this level. This is, in fact, the diametric opposite of window dressing. This is, in fact, opening up the windows so, so everyone can see in and see in from the vantage point of equity and inclusion. Well, let me push it here a little bit. Where does this come from? Why is this so important to you? Is it something in your background? Does it have to do with your vision for what a public university needs to be in a world with radically changing demographics or in a state with radically changing demographics. What's the, where does the impetus come from? You know, I once took a, one of these political tests to measure where you sit politically, but it was multidimensional. And they had one axis, which was fairness, and uh, sort of measurement of commitment to fairness. And I came at the extreme <laughs> in fairness. Uh, it comes from many motivations, partly my own personal background, of course, but all, also that I feel deeply that we need a society in which everyone is treated fairly and justly, and that simply isn't the situation in California or anywhere else for that matter. Secondly, uh, I know again from personal experience uh, that there's an extraordinary pool of talent out there which never gets tapped because for whatever reason, the people come from backgrounds where there are barriers put up which prevent them from moving forward. Uh, and, and we need to examine those barriers and find ways of ensuring that we access uh, all of the talent possible. Now that you've talked a little bit about where you fall on that, uh, the fairness spectrum, it makes a little bit more sense about two recent op-eds that you wrote over the summer. Um, one having to do with your advocacy for legislation in Sacramento that would have the state government match private gifts. Um, to support or to uh, support financial aid for undergraduates, uh, for students. And another one about the DREAM Act. Now, let's start on the second first. What, what is the DREAM Act and what did your op-ed say? Well, my op-ed on the DREAM Act really, the source of that was my concern over the debate uh, on the immigration law as a whole. And, I, you know, I was actually encouraged that President Bush, you know, understood what the issues were and was acting in such a humane fashion to try and guarantee that people who have fled desperate lives to come to the United States, even if they've come illegally, that we need to find ways of treating them fairly. Of course, it collapsed, uh, as we all know, and I was quite disturbed 
with some of the language that surrounded that collapse, what I thought was really mean-spiritedness. The people had forgotten that this was a country of immigrants, after all. So, so I, I don't personally see any way, and certainly I don't have, have uh, uh, the solution to solve this problem in one fell swoop. But I tried to think through, you know, what affects us directly here in California? What affects us here at Berkeley? And then I realized, uh, also from talking to some people, that there is in California something like 20,000 high school students who graduate each year from high school who got brought here, let's say, when they were five years old. Basically, the only society they know is California. Uh, and they turn out to be undocumented. Sometimes they don't even know they're undocumented. Then they apply to university. The best of those get into places like Berkeley. Uh, then they go to apply for financial aid find out they're undocumented, and then find out that they're in an extraordinarily difficult situation. So there is both federal and state legislation to treat these people fairly. And basically, you know, if they've come from such difficult backgrounds and have achieved at a level that got them into Berkeley, therefore overcoming barriers way beyond you know, what uh, people from more conventional backgrounds typically have overcome, then my view is just as a matter of fairness, we need to provide these people with both with financial aid so they can complete their educations without undue hardship, but also a pathway to citizenship, because we need these people. We don't have an infinite pool of talent. That's a competitive world out there, and to throw away all of this talent from these exceptionally talented people, it it's, uh, makes no sense whatsoever to me. Now, the second op-ed was also about access. It had to do with uh, your vision for sort of a unique uh, partnership between the state and, and private philanthropists. Talk to me a little bit about that. I mentioned early on that we have more students from financially disadvantaged backgrounds here at Berkeley, uh, specifically those on Pell Grants, than all of the Ivy League schools put together. Nevertheless, uh, if you're a poor kid and you do go to an Ivy League school, basically that school is able to cover all of the costs. I think Princeton led the way on this, and that's again very admirable. Uh, here at Berkeley, because we have so many, because we have 7,500 students in this situation. With the financial aid resources we have available, we can cover all the costs except the first $8,000. And the student himself or herself must provide that $8,000 to a combination of work, work study, and loans. That's called the self-help level. Uh, that's determined largely by the cost of living in the Bay Area, not by fees. So when we project forward, Many of our projections show, uh, barring some miracle, that that $8,000 is going to gradually increase so that five years from now, it might be as much as $12,500. So now we write a letter of admission to some uh, young uh, girl whose family income is $20,000 a year and say, congratulations, you've been admitted to Berkeley. We love you. We're going to make do whatever we can to make it possible for you to come here. But by the way, in the next four years, you're going to have to provide $50,000 on your own, right? right. Uh, and so will that be a tipping point? And will that uh, young lady then say, well, you know, I just can't imagine that, and I'm not willing to take on that much debt, so therefore I'm going to go to the local community college and not take advantage of my admission to Berkeley? My view is we cannot let that happen. In order to guarantee it won't happen, we need new sources of income. And one possibility which I've been discussing up in Sacramento for the last two years, is to create a new program uh, analogous to the Hewlett program, actually. But in this case, financial aid for undergraduates. That is a matching program. But in this case, instead of the Hewlett Foundation providing the match, we're asking the state government to provide the match. So th this would be only to create an endowment for needs-based financial aid, that is for young people from extreme financially poor situations. Uh, and so uh, I estimate that for the University of California system, that if the government would put up $150 million a year over the next seven years, and the UC system campus by campus was to raise the matching money, that that would then give us an endowment which far into the future would guarantee that we can continue to fulfill our public mission of providing an education to every talented Californian, independent of their income. You've drawn the connection to Hewlett. 
I get a sense of a chancellor who's struggling with a financial model, who's trying to find new ways. And it may seem ironic, but I get a sense from what you're saying that we're going to need private contributions to maintain the public character of the institution? That's my quote. <laughs> so, that's exactly correct. That in order, well, in order for us to, to remain a preeminent public institution, of course, we can, we can easily become a second-rate public institution, but then we will be betraying our commitment to the public. The public, the average person, deserves the same quality of education as they would get if they were an upper middle class or upper class person going to one of the elite private universities. It's our obligation as a public institution to provide a world class education. And we do that here at Berkeley, but we will not be able to do that for the indefinite future based on at least the current trend in public funding. So we have this I irony that we are not going to be able to meet our public obligation of providing a world-class education to any person independent of their ethnicity or financial means or sexual orientation or what have you, uh, unless we have private support supplementing and it must be on top of the public support. The other thing that's interesting here, you talked about Hewlett and we've talked about your initiative with the state and the DREAM Act and also to a certain extent the creation of the uh, Vice Chancellor for Equity and Inclusion position and a lot of that seems to be focused or revolving around undergraduate education which isn't something that you hear folks talk about a lot. Where does that fall in terms of your priorities and how you see Berkeley as it stands right now, undergraduate education? So, we often don't get credit, certainly not in US News and World Report, for the quality of the undergraduate experience that we provide here at Berkeley. We educate 24,000 young people at any given time. Uh, more of our undergraduates go on to get PhDs than any other university in the country. Historically, more of our undergraduates have gone on to join the Peace Corps than any other university in the country. Our undergraduates have a huge impact on society. So, of course, our undergraduates are extremely important to me. And I want to make sure, first of all, that the most talented young people can come here as undergraduates, and ideally that they can leave here without burdensome debt. Three years ago, in your inaugural speech, right around the time you started here as chancellor, uh, you mentioned three values that were at the heart of your vision for the institution. They were leadership, connection, and inclusion. Can you connect the dots between some of the things that are happening now on campus and those values as you set them out? So this entire conversation that we've just had indeed is about leadership, connections, and inclusion. Leadership uh, in terms of Berkeley playing a leadership role, whether uh, it's in global climate change or in, in inclusion, uh, or, or in um, financial aid for our undergraduates and, or in advocating for young people who are brought here, you know, not quite against their will but with no knowledge, right, and then find themselves uh, not citizens and no pathway forward in, a, in the only country that they've ever known. So that's about leadership. Leadership is about uh, uh, George Smoot's Nobel Prize and for us, uh, you know, having the very best faculty here who are doing world-class class research. Connections, that's what we've been talking about, is connections, whether it's partnering with BP, partnering with the Hewlett Foundation, uh, or, or what have you, and partnering with society as a whole. I was, on the connections front, I might mention, I was down in Oakland several weeks ago and had a wonderful meeting with Mayor Dellums where we talked about connections and how he went through the challenges that he faces as the mayor of Oakland, and he's, of course, a graduate of Berkeley. And we talked about ways in which university could connect to the leadership in, this, in Oakland and to the people in the community of Oakland. So that's another example of connections. Inclusion is uh, also, as we've been discussing, inclusion means that everybody who's a member of our community should feel included. Every single person, again, independent of what their background is, their ethnicity, their sexual orientation, should feel not only that they're included, but that Berkeley belongs as much to them as to any other person. So, Basically, uh, you know, I can't say that I, you know, was all that brilliant in pronouncing those three words uh, when, I, when I was writing my inaugural speech, but I thought, you know, these reflect my own values, and my values in many ways are those of an elite public institution, 
and therefore I projected them onto the university. And so far it seems to be providing a strategy which is, I hope at least people will agree, is working pretty well. So let's go out with the really tough question. Rumor has it that last year you reserved rooms in Pasadena right around the time of the Rose Bowl. Have you had any uh, conversations with your travel agent this year? This is just a false rumor, <laughs> but after uh, uh, the beginning of the season, and in particular the Tennessee game, I'm quite hopeful. I will say publicly now, if during my term as chancellor I never get to go to the Rose Bowl, uh, it will be a disappointment unless, of course, I'm going to the national championship. Great. You heard it here first. Chancellor, I want to thank you for your time. Thanks for joining us on this special edition of Bear in Mind, and we'll see you again next time. Thank you so much.